Yep. Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 91 of Libraries in Response on March the 7th of 2024, uh, four full years after we began this series in response to the declaration of the pandemic. Uh, as you can see, 91 sessions later, we're still here, uh, and you and your fellows uh, who are interested in libraries and technology innovation uh, have kept registering. So we keep doing this. So that's the way it's, it's working. Uh, today, it's another edition of Libraries in AI, which has been a, a popular topic for us. I guess the most popular topic, I could say, principles, practices, and plans. So this sort of covers the waterfront. We have three outstanding and returning speakers. Uh, Fiona, Justin, and Lee are, have all been with us before, and they're all back with either, well, with some kind of an update, a report on, on their doings. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, an open collaboration of libraries doing interesting things with technology, uh, mostly communications technology, but not only, obviously. Uh, AI is uh, an emerging technology that we're all trying to get our heads around, and that's part of what we're going to try to do today again. Our, our partner in this since the beginning is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, based in The Hague, and at the helm is the head of public policy for IFLA, Stephen Weiber in The Hague. Thank you, Stephen, again, and as ever. We've worked with IFLA for more than four years on universal public access. It's our shared view that every community should be connected. Not We, we can't take on the role of connecting every person in the world, but we believe every community should have an access hub, a uh, well, like a library or something uh, similar, whatever the community kind of trusts and gathers around. And that's been our, our combined work for a number of years. Our sponsor is uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, uh, sponsoring the series this year, which we are most grateful for. Libraries is a Swiss army knife of public institutions. Uh, I don't know, this hit me some months ago as a metaphor, and I couldn't come up with a better one. You know, there, there, there's a specific tool that may be better than the tools in the Swiss Army knife for specific projects. Like they're probably a better screwdriver, a better corkscrew or whatever, but they don't all, all exist in one place like they do with libraries. And it, it's just phenomenal that, that they have so much flexibility and they meet so many needs. And one that we have focused on or especially impressed by is their role in as uh, responders in crises that can scale from personal to local to regional to national to global. And uh, second responders is the term that we've joined into that that they're not they're not the fire, the ambulance, and the police, but they can back those up when you know and especially in large-scale events which we're seeing more and more of uh, because of the climate crisis and so people without electricity they will just go to a library because it's well i have to i have to find out what's going on and my phone is dead so i'll go to the library and they do they show up so it's uh it's tough uh it's it's getting tougher uh this is a term that has uh, arisen in the last year or so, polycrisis. It's like all these things that are happening, not in parallel, but actually uh, together. This is uh, the definition from the Cascade Institute, which focuses on this phenomenon. Multiple global systems causally, not casually, causally entangled in ways to significantly degrade humanity's prospects. Well, yeah. So here's the poor world longing for the good old days of mere nuclear annihilation, trying to deal with uh, all this is coming at. So today we're looking at the latest of those, which we consider artificial intelligence to be a crisis. We just don't know. Maybe it's, it, it's definitely changing things and it really looks like it's going to change things dramatically 
but whether it will spell the end of humanity or it's a new era of, uh, I don't know, some kind of happy nirvana thing, we don't know. What we what we do know is there's a lot of interest in it, a lot of anxiety, a lot of hope, uh, and an enormous amount of energy is being redirected to understanding it and integrating it into uh, plans and processes. So what's different now is that it's been around for a long time, but it's been in back end systems, embedded in uh, all kinds of you know what we generally refer to as algorithms that are. Uh, responding to user inquiries, guiding user behavior in social networks. I mean, all over the place, um, helping with just in time uh, trading, automated tra machine trading, uh, global supply chain. All these things have been in, have been using what we would call AI for some number of years. But now we've got uh, end user uh, manifestation and, and uh, notably in chat GPT. And then of course they're all, all kind of popping out everywhere doing all sorts of strange things. So we are, um, uh, we're formalizing our attention to this, this subject on the first Thursday of every month. That's what today is and welcome to it. Um, this is how many sessions we've looked at AI since, uh, January, well, three years ago. And I didn't know there were this many. I just went back the other day and looked. I thought there were like four, maybe five, but no, there are like eight or nine today. So here we are again. Those are all, uh, you can find all those on the uh, YouTube channel for Libraries and Response. And those are the session numbers that you would find them in. So let's get to it. Uh, we have Fiona and Justin and Lee. Uh, we're going to ask Justin to lead off and tell us what is happening at Columbus Metropolitan. Uh, welcome back, Justin. We're happy to have you and take it away. Great, Don. Thanks for that uh, intro here. And should be seeing my slides here. Go ahead and get this rolling. Um, I was going to mention that uh, Don was Don was just sharing that uh, they've been doing doing these libraries and response webinars for four years. I've been a little bit later to the party, but following along for for a little over the last year. Appreciate you sharing the uh, um, um, sessions that have covered AI. So didn't realize there were that many. I'll have to go back and uh, through the help of uh, YouTube rewatch some of those that I I missed missed before. Um, so to uh, Get us get us started here. Uh, I'm Justin Bumbico. I'm the IT director for the Columbus Metropolitan Library. I've been working in libraries here at Columbus for about 10 years. I've uh, been in IT, various roles, operational support, infrastructure roles for um, a little over 20 years now. I'm uh, just hoping to share a little bit about uh, where we have been uh, in the space of generative AI. Um, Don, just to pick up on one of your other points about AI being everywhere. And yes, it, it's definitely embedded in a lot of things. One of the terms we've used uh, to talk about some of those things and even really um, whether it's uh, uh, navigation with uh, mapping technology or even cybersecurity, we've, we've uh, called that hidden use cases of AI um, internally amongst ourselves. So um, always an, an important call out that uh, while there are lots of concerning things about the consumer side of this generative AI, um, it's definitely embedded in helping us in various ways um, every day. So uh, this slide really just speaks to um, some headlines, some highlights of um, the AI journey since ChatGPT was uh, publicly released in November of 2022. Um, and if you remember, there was a six month pause that was proposed that uh, didn't really happen, but some big names attached to that proposal, uh, Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, and uh, I think that caught a lot of attention, but uh, didn't really get much traction um, in slowing things down. Um, the updates and changes uh, have been, uh, um, and announcements of generative AI have been a roller coaster ride. Most every product has changed their names, uh, except for ChatGPT, that one has stayed consistent. So. 
it's uh, definitely um, kept kept myself busy as well as others uh, here in Columbus and trying to keep a pulse on this. But uh, in June of last year, we formed an AI task force um, to just what I said, keep a pulse on this. That's a cross-departmental team for us, uh, consisting of eight different uh, individuals. Um, took us a few months to get started, uh, but in October, we uh, initially and formally released some guidelines around what tools um, we felt comfortable supporting and, and how to use generative AI safely. And then, um, you know, called this one out in the November 2023 it was, uh, in, in relation to the uh, wild ride of generative AI, uh, the headline around Sam Altman being fired from OpenAI and um, you know, reinstated with a whole new board in less than five days just gives um, some background to just how, how quickly uh, the technology changes, but also um, environmentally how it's affecting uh, even the leader uh, in this space as well. So a little bit about um, our task force. Like I said, we're an eight person uh, group within the Columbus Library. We have uh, staff from public services, collection services, uh, human resources, our outre outreach group in IT. Um, our goal is really to analyze impacts of AI and what that might hold for our future. Uh, purpose here, uh, including um, on the slide, it's really just to um, stay abreast of developments, help staff understand what tools are available and how to use them. Uh, we always like to reiterate um, how to use them responsibly and ethically and help our teams understand what, um, oh, sorry, and, and try to begin to understand what our customers may be asking for uh, from a support and education standpoint. Which just brings me to what we've been up to um, in, in relation to this for about the last um, nine months. Um, besides meeting and sharing information, one of the first things that we did was reach out to other libraries with the intent of trying to understand what others were doing and where they, they are on their journey. So uh, if there are others that are interested in collaborating after this, certainly would be interested from hearing from you. Um, but what we learned is that there are a lot of, uh, a number of respondents who are interested in, in experimenting, but not a whole lot of concrete plans or actions at this stage last year. So this, this little research project does go back uh, several months. We did surface some conversations and collaborated with several libraries, um, including Dallas, Baltimore County, Indianapolis, and Toronto. Um, we actually had a call and spoke with Fiona uh, previously, who is presenting today. So it's great that she's, she's on this call here and her work in Toronto definitely stood out during our conversations. Um, so be interested uh, to hear uh, the good work that uh, she is doing in that space. Some of the other items that we've done include organizational training on AI chatbots. Uh, we tied this training to our cybersecurity awareness training that we do every year in October. So back when we released um, some guidelines and um, tools around uh, supported use, we uh, framed that around cybersecurity awareness month and training. Uh, as to what to do, what not to do, and, uh, you know, especially around the um, lens of confidential information and not inputting sensitive information into the uh, chatbots. Um, some of our task force members have had the opportunity to attend webinars and various trainings. Some of these call-outs uh, include training from the Iglesia Group, uh, who is a library consulting group. So a call out a staff member um, over there that was helpful to us, Jim Craner. And um, there's actually a free posting um, It goes back probably to that uh, mid-year timeframe last year, but he posted a, uh, a free training called Public Libraries and Artificial Intelligence Discussion that is uh, available out on YouTube. And um, if you go to Glacia's site and look for the plaid information, there are some use cases um, if you um, can get over to that plaid. AID site um, on use cases in public libraries. So that was valuable. Um, and then these webinars through the um, through Dawn and the Gigabit Library Network, the libraries in response have been valuable. Um, session Dawn was mentioning that um, um, being a little bit surprised in the number of people that watched uh, 
these after the fact, and I am one of them. So session 84 and session 87, um, 84 really had some good takeaways and 87 was I where I learned what the uh, state libraries were up to with, with the uh, slate group there. Um, and then we have a few staff members uh, participating in a uh, library journal training um, that actually just started this week. So I call those out um, just because there's a lot of industry or technology specific um, opportunities that are available, but what's available to libraries seem to be limited, um, but have stumbled across several of these and uh, they, they have been valuable as we've uh, decided on how to move uh, our practice forward. On the programming side, we've had done some external programming. Um, it's been a little bit limited, but we're actually planning some additional programming um, for this year. And then just like we're working to stay aware of library specific training options, we're also inquiring with our vendors as well as um, library software providers are what for what their plans on AI, um, AI assistance might be. Uh, we hear hints from most of our vendors, but not a lot of concrete plans yet. It uh, almost appears that in some ways there is a lot of hype going on in the space and managing that as part of this. Um, while the technology vendors determine what is the best um, items or products to develop that uh, could be could stick out there in the market for for public libraries. Uh, so same thing on on that topic. If there are software tools out there that you're you're using. I'd love to see any comments in the chat um, on those. And then um, finally, we've obviously experimented with all the publicly uh, available uh, consumer tools, including the main three, ChatGPT, uh, Copilot, Gemini, um, which I mentioned earlier, ChatGPT being the only one that hasn't changed their name in that space. Uh, there are a ton of other AI tools available, and I can't begin to keep track of all of them, but we have uh, team members who are experimenting with many different tools. Uh, which just brings me to um, a little bit of uh, ChatGPT and Copilot and how we've been using those. We have some use of ChatGPT with staff, um, but have not purchased a team account, so that's that's been used in a, in a minimal way. Um, we did sign up for an organization account that gave us access to OpenAI's Playground, um, which is more of a, a coding interface, uh, an API. Um, and if you go back several months, what was available to you was limited in comparison to what is available today, uh, especially from the, the quantity and the number of seats that you have to purchase. Um, so our guidelines, and moving over to the, the right side a little bit, um, are really built for internally for Copilot uh, due to the fact that we have, um, there's a free version of Copilot available, but um, we are licensed uh, for that middle tier there with commercial data protection, and that's available to all of our staff members. So that is um, where our guidelines are um, focused on uh, from a staff support standpoint. And it's in my brain, uh, it's just really removing a barrier just because that's available uh, without signing up for an extra account and has that layer of data protection uh, available to us. Um, but we're certainly keeping a pulse on on all of these and uh, trying to understand um, how they best fit uh, in the in the organization for us. And then on the also on the co-pilot side, um, just like Monday, we've gained access to a few licenses for uh, co-pilot for 365. Um, if you've seen any of the marketing material from Microsoft, that is the uh, component that takes it a step further. And if you're using Microsoft products, ties it into your um, Outlook client, your Teams client, your uh, PowerPoint presentations, Word, and, and allows you to generate that material faster. So I um, have just had my license for a couple of days, so I'm I'm uh, excited to see where that where that might take us. And then... Um, oh yeah, at the bottom of this slide there, I just posted some, some of our general guidelines that we've shared with staff around uh, security and uh, best practices. And then uh, if you've seen any of my images here and wondered what was up with them, um, of course, those were generated by uh, AI. So if you see some of the, the weird text that doesn't make sense, um, that is why, but I did try to generate uh, an image on, on every one of these slides, uh, but they're, they're slightly a little off. 
Um, so just to close out my portion of the conversation here, I'd um, just like to speak to kind of what, what uh, we're continuing to work on and what's next. Um, to some degree, it, it's a little bit more uh, of continuing what I've already mentioned. We do need to communicate um, to our team, to our staff um, a little bit more frequently. We need to formalize some training. Uh, so that is kind of on the top of my priority list right now is to develop some training material uh, and opportunities and try to couple those with Q&A sessions um, with our AI task force as follow-up items. Um, we're going to we're going to continue to seek out library specific applications and any development opportunities. Um, there's a promise there. We have a, a library chat interface, and the vendor that we use um, said that they were working on a development project for a human in the loop um, type of assistant to uh, assist the uh, staff members who are taking those chat requests. So. Um, be interested to see uh, how that progresses. But at the same time, we're um, looking to investigate feasibility of custom AI models, um, both internally and externally. So on the internal side, we have a lot of information. We have a lot of policies where a custom model could help us surface that information faster. On the external side, uh, same idea, same thing. We frequently hear that libraries have so many resources available and it's hard to navigate for customers. So you know, that is the idea is just surfacing that information faster of the um, available tools that we have uh, to them. With all of that comes the concerns around generative AI. You know, when we pilot this, if we get a tool, a proof of concept, we're going to want to kick the tires as much as possible. You know, we don't want to be in that space um, where we've seen headlines in the last year of hallucinations and the bots responding with misinformation. So that is, that is of course, an important factor in this, but um, there are opportunities um, to make us a little bit more efficient, make us a little bit more uh, relevant and useful in the sense of uh, generative AI. That's great, Justin. Uh, can we come back and pick up questions from you a little later? We need to keep moving here. Yep, that was basically it. So appreciate okay. it. Thank you. I've got a bunch of questions for you, but we need to move on to Fiona. So if you'll stop share and let Fiona yep. get going. That was great. It was loaded with stuff. It's impressive what you're doing. Uh, Fiona, please. Welcome mm -hmm. back. <laughs> that was great, Justin. Thank you for sharing all that information. All right. So I am sharing my screen. Hopefully everybody can see this. Yes. Start from the beginning. And there we Perfect. go. Okay. All right. Set. Okay. So um, thank you, Don, for putting this together today. Um, and this gives me a chance to discuss how Toronto Public Library is continuing to advance algorithmic literacy. So to, um, to describe what I do, I am a senior service specialist in digital literacy initiatives. And my role is to um, involves leading and evaluating the development of programs and services, staff training, uh, partnerships, collaborations, in the critical domains of um, digital literacy, data literacy, and digital privacy. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to review um, how we are developing our digital literacy skills in emerging technologies. Um, one of the main um, goals of my role is to provide um, digital literacy education within the local and global community. Um, by building knowledge, increasing resources, providing necessary skills um, so that our citizens can navigate this world safely um, and allowing um, our citizens to also um, think critically about um, the information that is out there and to recognize potential myths and disinformation and the biases that are intertwined. So how it all began, um, in June 2019, um, the City of Toronto proudly became a signatory um, to the Declaration of Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. 
And this significant move was driven by um, by a city councillor um, that was highlighting the city's commitment to digital rights and safety. So in acknowledgement of this groundwork that has already commenced in this crucial domain, city council funded a new position within TPL. Um, specifically dedicated to creating programming that advances digital safety and literacy that is in alignment with the Declaration's five principles. So the city's coalition for digital rights, um, they align with um, TPL's core values, um, recognizing that access to technology and proficiency in digital literacy are pivotal for the success, um, connectivity, and well-being of all Torontonians. And we are dedicated to translating these principles into actionable programs. So now connecting with talent within the Toronto Public Library is one of the several ways that we create rich programming opportunities for the public. So after the um, past um, few years, um, there's been many changes as we all know, and um, especially in generative AI. So seeing the need to further educate in this area, TPL developed an introductory program that introduces AI to our citizens basically covers what it is, how it learns, um, several examples of AI in our everyday life um, that sort of dives into the internet of things as well, of course. <clears throat> um, we have also produced Smart Cities program. Um, this is an introductory program um, that will highlight um, how these technologies are actively being used to make our cities run efficiently. Um, and in this program, we do discuss related privacy issues that are intertwined in smart city applications. So um, also over the last several years, we've ran a successful digital privacy series that offers steps on how to stay safe online. Now, working with Toronto Public Library senior producer in our communications department, we developed an INAI series. Um, the series is designed to ask those important um, questions that are related to AI and machine learning technology and its uses and privacy impact of our lives. So over the years, we've developed um, several programs um, such as uh, um, what's here on the slide. This was a program with TPL and MIT libraries, we hosted an online panel discussion called INAI Decoding the Bias that explored the need to create an inclusive and equitable um, artificial intelligence system and how to mitigate the underlying biases that are embedded in data sets and algorithms um, that is highlighted in the documentary film Coded Bias. Working with talent within the organization aids in creating rich programming. Um, um, an example of this is Toronto Public Library's Innovation Council um, that is comprised of leading individuals from academic, creative, and technology communities. So members provide valuable feedback, ideas, collaboration that helps shape service development and increase the library's profile in technology and innovation, as well as producing um, a series called Innovation Council Presents. So in this slide, this is a program um, that occurred last year. Um, we had Professor Wendy Wong and Innovation Council member Zara Ibrahim um, discuss Wendy Wong's book, We the Data, Human Rights in the Digital Age. So the program was about um, was about the evolving landscape of digital rights in um, our digital age. And the talk provided insights into the significance of human involvement and in data processes, the concept of data rights, mechanisms for holding data collectors accountable and more. Um, we do have an upcoming program to highlight in May of this year, it's an in-person, so, um, I'm not sure if it will be recorded, um, hopefully it will be, um, but this will be an interactive um, 
program with the council members to talk about generative AI. And this will take place at the end of May of this year. Okay, so this slide is an example of how we work with community agencies, government and educational institutions to bring in experts to discuss AI technologies. Um, so last year we collaborated with the Provocation Ideas Festival to host a concert with an AI theme. So we had a software artist, an award-winning musician, composer that combined human performance and computer-generated imagery. As a five-piece band performed, the screen behind them came to life, and, um, and the images were created by an AI-powered software. Concert also incorporated an interactive piece with the audience using a real-life polling, um, using an app, um, and this app provided the audience an option to choose various genres and instruments, and the band quickly adjusted to what was suggested. So this provided the audience with an example of how it works, um, but in a real life context. Uh, the program was moderated by our former innovator and in resident in music theory and technology who posed questions in between the songs to provide that thought provoking context. And many organizations and agencies align with the Toronto Public Library um, and working together really does strengthen our goals in building these necessary digital literacy skills. So collaboration to highlight is with uh, Media Smarts. Uh, Media Smarts um, develops digital media literacy programs, resources for Canadians. So we combined our talents um, to celebrate Digital Citizenship Day um, back in October last year. Um, we ho hosted a thought-provoking panel discussion featuring academic and technology experts about the challenges and opportunities faced by digital citizens today. So during that moderated discussion, various themes were explored. Um, that foster a more inclusive online community, combating online hate, how to stop the spread of false information and ethical considerations online users should be paying attention to um, when they're using emerging technologies. Um, digital citizenship is an important term in our present and future digital landscape. In September of last year, at the end of September, we welcomed nearly 100 guests in our inaugural um, digital expo. Um, so this was an afternoon that featured local agencies and industry leaders in the fields of artificial intelligence, smart cities, data privacy, um, where we discussed the importance of knowing and staying safe in today's ever-changing digital world. So the event began with a keynote on trustworthy AI, panel discussion and how to stay safe using AI technologies. And it concluded with a team presenting their research on clickbait in terms of use when using the internet. So the expo also featured exhibitors from local communities. Um, it was a huge success. Um, so we're, we're going to be doing this again the end of September of this year. <clears throat> Now, staff training. So digital literacy initiatives, lunch and learn sessions are an opportunity for staff to learn more about new technologies. Um, and this is where we can discuss important issues that our citizens face. So the following slide here is one of the many sessions that took place last year, um, AI in Everyday Life. And this was a discussion with former chief librarian at a local university who completed their um, PhD in um, artificial intelligence. And the session included how the popular app TikTok actually operates, um, the risks it may produce, the benefits um, that it can offer. And the hour also included breakout sessions. Um, so in this slide is actually one of the questions that we posed on to get staff thinking about um, how to program with artificial intelligence.
So in public libraries, um, resource guides are an invaluable tool offering um, both the public and staff an extensive repository of information on specific topics. So part of our commitment to staying at the forefront of evolving technologies, we're introducing new additions to our resource guide collection. So this year we're launching a resource guide specifically dedicated to AI chatbots and mis and disinformation. So this will um, dive into the intricacies of, of um, AI chatbots, the challenges that um, posed by mis and disinformation. So our objective is to provide our staff and the public with the tools that they need to navigate these rapidly advancing domains. By offering well curated resource guides, we aim to foster a culture of continuous learning and informed decision making. As well as resource guides, we all also offer book lists on topics. Um, book, lists, book lists are curated by staff. Um, and we also, uh, for all of our programs, um, we do recommend um, electronic resources for further um, learning opportunities, such as LinkedIn Learning, um, O'Reilly Tech and Business Books Online. So this is a quote um, from somebody who has taken one of our classes. Um, I'll just leave it here for a second for everybody to, to sort of read. But basically, it's um, it's it's telling us that um, that we're we're on the right track. Um, we're we're putting forth this information that is easy to understand, and it um, and it makes sense. And um, so, I think this is just showing that we're 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 heading in the right direction. Now, lessons learned. Oh every year um, brings forth new challenges, especially in this rapidly evolving landscape of technology. And staying abreast of these changes is crucial, um, especially when we're putting together programs um, such as we've been putting together. Um, so what may seem sound applications when planning a program, um, well, they quickly turn. So an illustrative example of this occurred um, during the development of a program named Creating AI Visuals Using Stable Diffusion. So originally conceived as a hands-on workshop, this program aimed to introduce participants to stable diffusion. However, challenges emerged when the chosen software became entangled in the lawsuit fraught with copyright issues. And responding to this, we, um, we had to pivot. So we collaborated with the artist designing the program um, and we turned it into a thought provoking um, discussion. And this shift allowed us to address the pros and cons of AI image generators, diving into the intricacies of AI technologies that includes ethical considerations, particularly regarding copyright implications. So um, this is a, a, a very um, good example of how um, one will have to pivot um, in especially when emerging technologies are swiftly changing. So we recognize um, that dialogue creates an informed and knowledgeable community and providing a voice beyond traditional library um, boundaries is key in establishing partnerships and promoting awareness. So throughout the years, I've had the opportunity to present at various conferences, symposiums, panel discussions, along with like-minded community agencies. So these platforms not only disseminate crucial information, but they also play a vital role in building connections and partnerships. So um, something to highlight, in last year, I collaborated with the University of British Columbia to write a co-authored opinion piece highlighting the critical role of libraries advancing digital literacy. So this was published in our national, one of our national newspapers um, late last year. And this collaborative um, effort underscores our dedication to championing the cause of digital literacy and its significance of today's society, in today's society, I should say. 
And um, to tie back to the cities for digital rights, when I began, I completed an environmental scan that looked at every city and what are they doing, exploring programs, training, and so on. And during my research, I, um, I really did gain valuable insights into the initiatives undertaken um, by libraries, community agencies, and government bodies. The scan is published on the Cities for Digital Rights webpage, and it'll be updated um, because many more cities have joined since I did this scan. Um, so hopefully that'll be complete by the end of the year. I did have an opportunity to present um, when the scan was complete back in 2022, a virtual meeting hosted by the United Cities and local governments um, that was attended by nearly 80 civic, um, 80 cities and civic leaders from around the world. And it was an awesome meeting um, that included discussion about how cities can support their citizens' digital rights and digital literacy needs. So by you wrap yeah, for here? I I'm on my last last oh, there we go. Great. point. You are you're awesome. Thank you. Um I I will end that connecting and collaborating. We are really strengthening our collective journey um, towards a digital literate future. Um, and that brings me to the end of my um, of my presentation. And thank you for for listening of your superb presentation, Fiona. This was just fact. I'm going to watch this again myself. Uh, there was just too much to take in. Uh, clearly, you're you know leading in this as a, as a practitioner. Uh, there are just tons of questions that I've got for you, but I'm going to hold off. There are a couple in the chat. Maybe you can address those uh, directly. I want to give Lee a full run here. <clears throat> but the one of the things you I just want to comment on was was security and the importance of all the attention we've been reading about right now is all back end, you know, that Facebook has to do a better job and Google to do a better job, all that, and how they're using this stuff. But with all security issues, the end user behavior is as important as anything. And so that translates to us in education and literacy. And without that, then all these back end things are fairly futile if users are not uh, doing their part. Uh, and that's opens uh, it's a point it opens up opportunity as you've shown for libraries. So Lee, take us away here with this new we're seeing your uh, workshop list as opposed to the full uh, play mode. We can see your <laughs> next slide on the margin there. Oh, uh, okay. well, you are screen right. sharing. Okay, great. Take it away, Lee. Welcome. Welcome back. Thanks so much, Don. It's wonderful to be back with you. Um, I was I was at I was the the um, a session seventy two on your on your list about the future okay. of um, human agency in in this new environment, and I did that when I was wearing my old hat as the director of Internet and Technology Research at the Pew Research Center. I thought I was going to retire from Pew last June, but I got this offer to continue on with this future of the internet uh, work at Elon University, where I'd had a long-term research partnership. And uh, and so I'm delighted to say that I have flunked retirement and I'm now um, running uh, the, the center at Elon that is going to continue the, uh, the future of the internet work and do a lot more things um, in between. So we put out a report last week uh, called, it was looking at the future impact of artificial intelligence. And for the purposes of this presentation, I think participants here might consider it sort of a map of the universe that they're dealing with, both uh, with their staffs and with the with the public uh, on thinking about these things. In many cases, it speaks to the worries that people have about artificial intelligence and the kind of things that they will engage libraries as they as they encounter this world. And there are two things going on in this report. So there, we have expert opinions, which are just sort of transcendent and wonderful. Uh, and Stephen Abram uh, gave one of the most brilliant uh, answers to our, our query, and we highlighted it in our publications here. 
And we also ch changed up the model that I used to run at Pew, which was only dealing with expert opinion about the future. And we added a public opinion component to this. So uh, there, uh, I will be sharing some of the expert opinions and the main themes of the experts, as well as some of the findings that we had when we talked to a representative sample of American adults, which is probably um, maybe a, a step or two ahead of maybe other parts of the world, but not too much. I mean, everybody is encountering this material in real time, dealing with it in real time, walking into libraries uh, with real time questions uh, that in many cases librarians are, are going to be wrestling with at the same time. So um, Michelle, Michelle uh, uh, proposes hitting F9 to get in full play mode. Is that I'm hitting F9, maybe control F9. Um, how, how is that? It's the same. I'm sorry. Uh, F five. Oh, darn. F5. 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 Oh, okay. F5. Maybe control F5. Anyway, I've hit F5 and it is not, no, not seeming control, to be. Just oh, hold on. Hold on. F5. I don't. I, I've hit it. Is, is it not working? All right. No, Let's no, carry on because we, we can see it. It's it's okay. It's, we, it's fine, really. Excuse the interruption, Lee. Um, there's a lot of data here, and I'm uh, Don. I'm going to send you my slides so that you can send it to the distribution list here, and you don't have to be feverishly taking notes or squinting at your screen to be to be looking at this. I'm sorry for the for the glitch here and the in the presentation. Uh, okay, so the the thing that the experts were responding to and that we highlighted was a prompt to have them essentially write um, open ended answers. So, so in many cases, they wrote essays responding to the prompt, considering the likely impact of the proliferation of AI in individuals' lives and so big social systems, how will life have changed by the year 2040? And there are five themes that came out of the, um, the, the way that we organized and understood the responses that we got to this big question. The first theme was we we're going to have to reimagine what it means to be human. There's a lot of conversation about the boundary between machines and people uh, being it now a very permeable line, a very changing line. As new technologies come online, it will it will change as we begin to wear some of this technology on our bodies, as we can begin to incorporate it internally into our bodies, as it as certainly enhances sort of the uh, the learning and teaching um, that goes on in, in human experiences. And so, you know, there's there's a lot to be freaked out as you think about that that subject. But there there's some hope uh, among these experts that if we set ourselves on the right course now and we keep and AI uh, sort of under our uh, control, that things will work out well. But but th this quote that I highlighted here from Tracy Follows, who's a wonderful futurist, talks about how, uh, particularly in a customized world where all of this stuff can be personalized. There are going to be people having sort of individualized senses of how the world works and how other uh, human beings work and how the reality works and things like that. So there's a sense that confusion and crisis over AI and uh, aided identities could cause a lot of turmoil, uh, both at the community level and, of course, at the global level. The second theme just flows out of the first theme. Societies must restructure, reinvent, or reemplace and trend systems as humans and their learning capacity, as their cognitive capacity sort of shifts in this world. The things that we have built, uh, many of them from the analog age, um, are you know, being disrupted and not necessarily organized to prepare us for the world of the future. Uh, that's just sort of abundantly clear in the kinds of things that Justin and Fiona were saying. You know, the institutions are, are sort of uh, being challenged to think of new ways, new norms, new systems to gather up information, promote new kinds of learning, promote new kinds of literacy and things like that. Um, and and uh, Lene, uh, Rachel Anderson was the one we're highlighting here who talked about how the institutions haven't yet seemed to uh, want to understand the scope of what we're facing, much less uh, begin to deal with it. The third theme is that humanity could be greatly enfeebled by AI. We will become so dependent on it. We will become uh, so used to dealing with it and incorporating it into our lives, our work and our play and things like that, that we will outsource uh, maybe our own uh, agency and integrity and even our thinking processes to AI. Stephen Adelson talked about how people will be less likely to write their own stories, to read deeply, and to be challenged to think in creative ways. They're going to become more passive, was his argument. And that was a recurring theme that really harkens back to that first theme about 
humans are going to change in this environment. Then there was a theme that was really interesting that basically said, sure, this is all transformative technology and and um, and was going to be important to the distribution of, of uh, you know, human in enterprise and human initiative and things like that. But tech focusing on technology isn't the right way to think about this. A bunch of these experts argued the best and worst uses of these technology are going to be in human control, particularly as these uh, these tools roll out and as criticisms of them or feedback into them comes uh, into the fore. And so there's a sense that um, humans still have control of things and the way that humans deploy these systems and regulate these systems is very much the way that uh, is going to shape how they roll out. And of course, there was a, the, you know, when you invite a question like this, how are things going to change in the future for good and for bad? There are a lot of experts, even some of those who are the most uh, downcast or most um, worried about the future said, look, there are clearly going to be major advantages that come from this. They're going to be related to big systems of how people learn. There's a lot of hope about healthcare applications, both at the diagnostic level and the treatment level and the, at the public health level. There are going to be lots of ways that our systems, uh, you know, there's re references to smart cities and things like that, that our, the environment itself will become much smarter, much able to tell us things to, to engage in the future. So uh, Jerome Glenn, who's a marvelous um, futurist at the Millennium Project, usually is very um, uh, worried uh, about the contours of the future, but he decided to um, go against his own type this time and sketch out a beautiful, lengthy scenario of the many, many ways that these tools can be turned to our advantage. For the first time in history, he wrote, humanity will be highly engaged in conversations about what, what kind of civilization it wants and what we as individuals and as a species want to become. Pretty noble vision, uh, the things like uh, to, to the way that we're, we can think about the future. Then and now turning to the uh, public opinion survey that we uh, that we did. We asked about 15 dimensions of individuals, lives, and institutions and systems, and asked the basic question. Well, we asked a couple of introductory questions. You know, what will the impact of increased use of AI uh, on the quality of people's lives be in the coming years? You can see it's an absolutely widely divergent split verdict. People, a lot of people don't know. About a quarter don't know. Um, about a third say equally positive and negative. And then, you know, there are many more people who just, if they want to pick a side, they say it'll be more negative than positive rather than say more positive than negative. But this is the environment we're in. There's a lot of wariness. There's a lot of uh, concern and uncertainty about where things are going. Um, and I, I think, you know, both Fiona and Justin were talking about some of that, uh, both in internal to the library world, but also in the wider world. And then we asked about the capacities of AI. So one of the big tests that uh, technologists always sort of offer humanity as they build these things out is it shouldn't be perfect, they argue, but it should be better than humans are. So we asked this question, you know, do you think AI systems uh, can consistently make decisions in people's best interest in, in complex situations? And again, hugely split, uh, split verdicts. Third said it's possible, third said it's not possible, and, and more than a third said it, they're not sure about this. So there's a way that they people have a sense that we're building these systems, um, and we don't yet know how it's going to play out. Then we asked about these dimensions of life, and we asked whether things are going to be more positive than negative, more negative than positive, um, whether they, it would be equally positive and negative. And we asked also not sure, because when you're talking to the general public, there are just a lot of people who haven't even heard of artificial intelligence, or even when they use artificial intelligence in their lives, don't know they're using it. And so the thing to hear that um, we're focusing on is the sort of delta between the negative and the positive answers. So there are people who are much more likely to feel negatively about AI and its implications for people's privacy than to think positively about that. That 66% versus 4% delta is the largest one we got in our survey. Similarly, huge concern about the future prospects for employment and employment opportunities. People have jobs on their mind when they're thinking about this, and they're much more worried than uh, sanguine about how things are going to play out. And about a fifth of people said they're not sure. 
Then we asked about civility and people's relationships with others. And again, there's a sense that machines are going to insert themselves and themselves into human social interactions. So uh, about half said it'll be more negative than positive, and only seven percent said more positive than negative. And there's even greater uncertainty about how this is going to play out in the future, just in terms of how the human community and, and human relations are affected by this. Basic human rights is another place where there's much greater concern than there is um, good feeling about how things are gonna play out. And even more than a quarter said, we have no idea how this is, is gonna play through the future. And interestingly enough, when we looked at the um, all of these uh, answers, when it came to not sure, the, uh, the people who had lower levels of education were much more likely than people who had higher levels of education to be saying that. People who were in a sort of marginalized communities were also somewhat more likely to say they were not sure compared to people who would give an answer. Um, and in many cases, it was a split answer, some negative, some positive, but there are lots of people who are not sure. And there's a particular sort of uh, demographic and psychographic profile to those people that's worth paying attention to. Then things begin to tighten up a little bit when we asked about physical and mental health. People are more worried uh, than concerned. And in other surveys that we've done, um, there's, a, there's a sense of splitness here. In physical health, people are, are pretty confident that AI can be able to help at the diagnostic and treatment and, and observational level. But when it comes to mental health, there's a, there's a great level of concern that these uh, machines are going to enfeeble us again and sort of be distracting and diverting and take us away from real kinds of human encounters. Here's one where it's a purely split verdict uh, when it comes to sort of mis and disinformation. I actually thought when we asked this question, we were going to get a a lot more people concerned about deep fakes and their impact on things. But we got a split verdict here, negative and positive sort of came out the same way. Then we asked about day-to-day -day work activities. And remember, people are concerned about job opportunities in the, in the future. But when they asked about how their current jobs might be affected by this, there's a split verdict. Negative and positive came out pretty much the same. And so there's a way these tools are serving people or people have a sense that they can serve them in their jobs, even as they worry about uh, down in the future, it will, it will not turn out well for them. Same thing, a split verdict when we ca it came to leisure time. There are lots of people who said sort of equally negative and positive, lots of people who said not sure, but there's a sense, um, particularly in the expert world, of course, that this is these tools are gonna free up a lot of time for us. And it's going to be up to us to figure out how we're going to fill that time with meaningful, purposeful things or whether we're going to be distracted or, you know, entertained uh, to death. Um, and then we asked about um, big systems questions. So that, that ended the part where we were asking about people and individual impacts. And now we're asking systems questions. And of course, top of the list here is concern about what it's gonna do to uh, political systems. Many more people think the, the impact is gonna be negative than positive. I think people are layering in their, their general concerns about the tone of politics, particularly in North America these, these days. And, and sort of that's getting wrapped up in, this, in their sensibility here. They're also thinking that sort of the, the information warriors are just gonna have a new set of tools to be working with here in, in ways that will be divisive. More negative than positive when it came to the general level of civility and society, not just people's own relationships with each other, but there's a sense that the, you know, the machines uh, don't do us well when they uh, get in the way of our human relationships, even though you can sketch out some scenarios where it's gonna be helpful. Again, a big delta when it comes to negative over positive, when it comes to reducing wealth and inequalities. When we ask the same question of the experts, there's even higher level of concern among experts that uh, general levels of inequality are gonna grow rather than shrink as these tools get embraced by um, you know, sophisticated um, early adopter types and people who can turn these tools to their advantage as opposed to uh, other segments of the population who are just gonna be sort of along for the ride and maybe again enfeebled by these tools rather than um, empowered by these tools. Then we asked about primary and secondary schools, a little bit closer verdict there. People are more worried uh, than not a little bit about the impact on primary and secondary schools. And it's basically the same story when it comes to colleges and universities. There's a sense that the learning environment, the teaching environment is deep disrupted by these tools, but it might be that really great teachers and really smart um, sort of educational and literacy specialists are going to figure out how to, uh, to make this work. Sorry, here's um, environmental protection. This is one of split verdict. There's a sense that, again, 
for big systems and analytical purposes and actually doing roadmaps for how to address wicked problems and things, there's a there's much more um, sort of a double sense here, negative and positive are sort of equal. A lot of people are not sure across uh, about this, but it's it, it was interesting that those um, differences between negative and positive are, are statistically insignificant. Uh, on this question. And finally, the one that was called clear cut winner, or more people feel positively than negatively relates to healthcare systems and medical treatments. The, 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 there's just a sense that um, as these things roll through the medical system from top to bottom, that it's going to turn out relatively well. So that's what I got. And um, I'm happy to, uh, to um, hear everybody's questions now. Don, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. So uh, one one question suggests um, a baseline for these responses. So asking a question like, do you think computers are beneficial or harmful to humanity would be kind of a starting point before you kind of ask them about AI, which they may or may not. I mean, people may have a general feeling about technology in general, that they would just transfer to any technology that comes up. But uh, uh, how did you kind of deal with the, you know, the pre pre existing biases to to pluck those out of the of the responses? Did you? Well, I think, you know, in, in a way, we didn't attempt to do that. Uh, but the, the the sort of good best practices in the polling environment to justify doing that is you want to get people's basic readings, uh, their gut level sense, their their sense of um, how values might play through this rather than, you know, the specifics of the technology or the specifics of the applications and things. And so we got, you know, I, it came out to be that people are wary. They have some sense of hope. You know, it was really interesting as we got these answers was there was not a uniform set of judgments about it's all bad or it's all good. There's quite nuanced judgments, depending on what you're asking about and things that shows up in people's general reactions too. They, they have a kind of balance sheet mentality. Some things are going to work out better. A bunch of things might not work out so well. And so they're wary and watchful is probably the right way to be thinking about the public on this. Right. Uh, and I think a lot of results kind of make sense. Like, uh, health information, you know, almost everybody has gone to the internet searching for health information themselves or relatives, something they, they suddenly are become an intense student and expect to get, you know, valid information from the internet. So it, that makes sense that the, that this would uh, be seen as a positive. You know, the, the other thing that I, as I was listening to, to Justin, the, the other thing that's amazing about these technologies is that um, so as Justin pointed out, uh, ChatGPT comes into the world in late November 2022. Um, by February uh, 2023, so less than three months later, 100 million people were, said they were using it. We have never seen a, a growth slope like that. Not, not the internet, not smartphones, not social media, not television back in the day. Getting to 100 million people in that quick a time is unprecedented. And so there's a sense that, you know, it's worth looking at and worth trying out. And, uh, and so the, 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 the challenge for librarians in many cases is going to be to keep up with people and to help them um, turn this to good purposes for themselves. Uh yeah, it makes sense, uh, given how we've been exposed to AI as science fiction for a long time. So I think it's in been in people's minds for a long time. And suddenly it's something's here that you can actually get your hands on, not just sort of read about somebody doing something with. So it's kind of understandable. And of course, the fact that it was kind of gave surprising results, uh, really surprising results to a lot of people uh, fuel that. I, I put myself kind of on the pessimist side of the equation. It's it's not so much what AI could do, but to me, it's more what big AI will do. And we're already kind of under siege from these uh, large platforms who are less and ever less trustworthy and manipulating behavior, uh, our data, our privacy, and the rest of it. So now they have a super weapon or a super tool. Uh, and 
it seems like we're relying on their good behavior for this stuff to work out. And that gives me pause is all I can say about that. So that's just a personal opinion on optimism. Pessimism. You've heard of this uh, P-Doom uh, factor. It's uh, like how, what do you give the chances of AI ending civilization? And so it's like 80% or 5%. The optimists say 5%, which I consider pessimistic, one in 20 chance of something so cataclysmic. But uh, I don't know if anybody has that kind of thought in their mind, but uh I'm going to, I'm going to call on Stephen Abram here in a second. And we're also running over time a little bit. And I appreciate it uh, that you're staying. This is not, you know, a TV show. We don't have a hard stop, but I also want to respect people's time. So we'll go a little bit over, but if anybody needs to go, uh, we'll totally understand. Uh, my, my one, one of the point uh, was made by Fiona and Stephen both, I think was related to collaborations and this seems like such a powerful element of this particular technology in your your all your relationships, since this is impacting everything and everyone conferring with possible partners seems like a way to really uh, learn more about it and make it more more powerful. Uh, but I had a question for uh, Fiona, uh, well, both Fiona and and Justin. Have you discussed uh, like a formal strategy for this stuff? Are you just doing things as they come up, as they appear to be, uh, you know, useful and interesting or demanding or something like that, and just kind of going in response to what's coming at you, or or have you taken a step back and said, well, this is this is what we believe about this technology, this is what we think we can do, and these are our priorities, that kind of a thing. I'm just I'm really curious. This is part of our our slate activity is encouraging a, a, a strategic approach to this technology rather than just, uh, you know, catching here and there. So Fiona, it, I think you and I talked about this before. <laughs> Sorry. We did. <laughs> did we had a great anything? discussion about this, actually. Um, everybody is... we talked? <laughs> um, oh, yes. Um, we asked ChatGPT to develop a framework for us. And no, I'm just joking. Um, honestly, we do not, um, we do not have a framework in place yet. Um, is there talks of that? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't really say at this, at this very point. Um, does it make sense? Yes, it does. Um, I mean, I, I, I will look at, um, I live in Ontario. Um, one of our provinces here in Canada, and um, and they are developing a, a trustworthy um, AI framework. So they're in the midst of of developing something that is not that is not ready yet, um, and that will you know comprise of policies and guidance and how to you know how to navigate this this complicated subject. Um, but yeah, as for now, we um, we do have a strategic plan, of course, yeah, of course, as every library does. And in that strategic plan, we are um, it, you know, I'm adhering to to digital literacy. It's one of our main points, and um, and then also we are tied in with the cities for digital rights and following their principles that they have in place. Um, so that um, that's as close as I can get at this point. No, that's that's good. Yeah. That's good. It makes sense. It's it's a it's a kind of a collaboration, if mm -hmm. albeit perhaps coerced, uh, because you're obligated to the city. Uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, it's a good point and, and it's an understandable. Justin, any any quick comment on strategy? Uh, yeah, quick comment is just yeah, it's a little more ad hoc than uh, we would we would like. If you saw me. Uh, digging around in my bag, I was pulling out the developing a library strategic response to AI from IFLA. So um, that is a good uh, reference uh, for anyone, but we would need to uh, ourselves put some effort and work into that to more formalize uh, what we're doing. Uh, that's a very good reference. And thank you for mentioning that. Uh, IFLA published that a few months ago, I believe it was uh, late last year. It's an excellent uh uh, format for uh, looking at uh, looking at strategy development. 
It's an outline for that. It's very detailed. So turning back to Canada, uh, Stephen. <laughs> welcome Thankfully, back. Yeah, I love coming to these sessions. And uh, thanks, Don. Uh, I, I have a couple of comments that I'd like the panel to, to talk to. And it's in the context of Lee's really smart framing of the Elon University report to be 2040. All the research shows that futurists are more accurate when they look longer term than short term stuff. So when we're in our stew right now, we're using the wrong frameworks to evaluate AI. People like librarians all over the world are testing it as a search engine. And then some of them are finally emerging to understand what a transformative pre-trained engine is. And that's a, a learning path that we that we will have surmounted by 2040. However, by 2040, uh, implied in Lee's report are the things that need to happen. So one is sector-based uh, frameworks to look at this and use cases. And so we can look at the use cases that might be society or community in general from an academic or public library point of view, or we can look at it from a big stuff. So we know as librarians that the medical stuff we're trusting because it's highly formatted data and we can trust what's going to come out of it. Whereas when we look at uh, them licensing Twitter and Reddit, we're going, we're, we're going to see a, a free for all added into chat GPT. So those are fascinating things to me as, as we look at how do we get to 2040 and have the right global and sectoral um, thought processes and collaborations and cooperations to happen. Librarians are question? an important part of it. Like ChatGPT is trained on our systems. We built them. Is that your question? That's sort of the, the, the thing to react to. Okay. Uh, Lee, I think we go to you first there. Uh, yeah, of course, Stephen goes super high road and and uh, and, and it's, it's a big, hard question. Um, I, first of all, librarians always are power users of this stuff. It was true pre-internet. It was true internet and it's, and it's different uh, revolutions in mobile connectivity and social media and, and even virtual reality and stuff like that. And so in a way, librarians can think of themselves as the most important um, alpha or beta testers of these systems and have a voice through community, you know, communal and, and large scale organizations like IFLA to sort of call out the bad stuff and, and, and to teach each other the bad stuff and to, to then, you know, go to the level that Fiona and Justin were talking about of you know, establishing what best practices might look like. Um, so I think, you know, testing and giving voice. And, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, you might consider adding to the repertoire of libraries is whatever the AI equivalent of hackathons is. You'll want lots of different kinds of citizens from lots of different kinds of circumstances um, stress testing this stuff, because it's not every librarian that's going to be able to imagine what the red team version of things is or what the, you know, what the, what the goofy version of things is. So you're going to want to sort of aggregate as much community insight you know, from ordinary folks as possible. The other thing is that by, you know, thank you for saying that the framing was right. 2040 was just a nice even year as much as anything else for us. We did want to look farther into the future. And, you know, there's a palpable sense that this is the, the pivot moment for lots of this stuff. And both at the individual use case level, as well as the sort of general uh, intelligence level, which everybody's sort of debating about and things like that. So I, um, I, there's still ways that reinforced learning can be brought to bear in this to have it turn out better than not. There are still ways to sort of signal what kind of guardrails would make sense uh, in most models. And there's still ways to build your own models now. You know, there there people like Justin, uh, the IT specialists are going to be able to do trustworthy, library informed, library norm uh, infused things that bring hundreds of years of intelligence and systems to this stuff. And you are not going to just have to rely on the big tech, tech companies to sort of um, do it for us. Matt, yeah. Fiona, anything on that? I, um, 
Lee, I really like your idea about the the stress testing. I think that that is um, key in in kind of like where where are we going? Where are we missing? You know, like where where can we where can we fill in the blanks? Um, you know, I, I'll always say to you know some some colleagues will reach out to me from different library institutions, and they're like, um, I don't know a lot about this stuff. So how, how would I even get started? And it's kind of like, just use examples, you know, um, show examples and kind of like, hey, let's talk about it. Let's talk about that myth and disinformation that's sort of intertwined in this, in this image or in, in whatever it may be. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of my, my immediate thoughts. Lee, okay. Thank you. Libraries as laboratories. I think it's yeah. just so powerful a concept. And what else does the community have that even approaches a, a service like that and how valuable that is for community learning and development? This is just incredible. Justin, any add on there? Oh, I like um, the topic of AI literacy and some of the points that were called out um, in session 84. I also like uh, what Lee was saying uh, as librarians, uh, libraries being the uh, uh, major uh, testers in this space. And of course, uh, an open model with the information that is available out there on the internet is inherently flawed. Uh, custom and closed models, you can train them a little bit more uh, and better. So if you're talking about um, not completely following Stephen, but a medical application, yeah, that's I'd assume that's closed, that's trained uh, with specific data sets. So my question just is, um, you know, for safe safe tools from a learning standpoint, who will be the first to build those? Will those be uh, built by the uh, big vendors? I see a lot more in K through 12 um, from an educating uh, youth standpoint. So that's those are my questions. But yeah, I think the open models are are flawed. Good, good point. And I've I've been having a kind of a fantasy about a a, a, a mass librarian model training project where a certain model building on the trustworthiness of librarians is then put into use that people could you know have some reliance on and and not think they're going to be manipulated or sold or the usual stuff uh, we are library over... gpt can't be trademarked but, but get it now <laughs> grab it quick uh yeah. put it in in the uh open uh open copyright uh, we're we're way over an hour, but you know we could go on easily for another hour. There's so much here, and we will we will take this up. But today, I think we should uh, respect people's time, which we so appreciate your giving to us, uh, and, and hope that it's worth your while. So I want to especially thank our speakers, Lee and Fiona and Justin, for being here and giving us just excellent excellent content today. To, mull over and think about again. And Stephen, thank you for your uh, weighing in, your usual uh, additive uh, participation. So with this, I'm going to stop the recording right now. And thank you all.